Okay, I'll start. Okay, let me introduce myself. I'm sure everybody knows, but keep on repeating this. Okay, I'm Meg Layasi. I'm the chair of the Philippine Study Group of Minnesota. We are a group of Filipinos, Filipino Americans, Americans and friends committed to supporting the struggle for human rights, peace and social justice in the Philippines. Uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you for being here this afternoon to help us welcome Aubrey, full name, Auris Aubrey Bahala, to Minnesota, who will be in our midst for about four more months, five more months. Aubrey is very interested to be connected with our Filipino community. And one way of connecting with us is by sharing her presentation on her work on building peace in Muslim Mindanao. Aubrey came to Minnesota in early August as a Humphrey Fellow attending the University of Minnesota for the 2022-2023 cohort. She was born in Manila, attended the University of Santo Tomas for her bachelor's degree in political science, her master's degree in public administration and public policy from the University of the Philippines. Before working at her current job, at the Institute for Autonomy and Governance in Cotabato City. She worked as a college instructor and had worked on climate change and human security with the German Agency for International Cooperation. At the Institute for Autonomy and Governance where, where she's working now, she is a training expert and its program coordinator. She works to build governance capacity of stakeholders involved in the transitional period to resolve the decade-long conflict in Mindanao. The stakeholders are the political parties, civil society, indigenous peoples, and officials of the Bangsang Moro Autonomous Region of Muslim Mindanao, also called BARM. The government of the Philippines signed a peace agreement in 2014 with the Moro Islamic Liberation Front, the MILF, which was followed in 2018 with the signing of the Bangsa Moro Organic Law that created BARM. And BARM replaces ARM, ARM uh, as the governing body of the five provinces previously governed by ARM plus Cotabato City, Lapitan City, and Marawi City in Western Mindanao. As part of her Humphrey, as part of her Humphrey Fellowship, Aubrey is working with a nonviolent peace force, a nonpartisan, nonprofit, and armed peacekeeping organization that has been in Mindanao since 2007. I'm gonna get my gum out. There will be a Q&A after the presentation. For the Q&A, you may write in your, your questions in the chat or you can simply raise your hand or simply unmute yourself. Again, thank you all for coming and thank you very much, Aubrey, for this presentation, Peace in Mindanao, Peace in Muslim Mindanao, the transition of autonomous region of Muslim Mindanao that is ARM, to Bangsang Moro Autonomous Region of Muslim, Muslim Mindanao, which is BARM. Uh, we greatly appreciate your giving us this, this presentation, allowing us to learn what is going on on that part of Mindanao. Uh, thank you all for coming and for joining in the conversation and with great appreciation and honor, I now present Aubrey, your turn Aubrey. Thank you so much, Tita Meg, for that very kind and generous introduction. Thank you to the Philippine Study Group of Minnesota for inviting me to speak today and to share a little bit about the Southern Philippines, particularly the Bangsamoro region or formerly known as the Autonomous Region in Muslim Mindanao. Thank you as well to everyone who's joining us on Zoom. 
Uh, I hope that you will find this pre presentation insightful. And if you have questions, please, uh, we will have the opportunity to talk. I would rather have this presentation be a conversation than just me talking for a full hour. So please let me know what your thoughts are in the Q&A box and I would be happy to answer them. Um, let me share my screen first. Let me know if you can see it. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, thank you. So uh, I will be try I, I will try to um, give you the highlights of my presentation. And if there is any point that you would like some clarification, please let me know. Um, like I said, I would rather have this presentation be a conversation than just like um, what me talking to for an, a full hour. So thank you so much for being here. Let me start uh, to let me start by giving you the outline of my presentation. So I will be talking about the short background of Muslim Mindanao. I will give some context uh, as to where we are right now in the region. We will also be talking about comparing the previous uh, political structure, which is the ARMM, and uh, the Bangsamoro region, which is now the new autonomous region in Muslim Mindanao. I will be also be presenting uh, a little bit about the ongoing political transition in the region and the opportunities or prospects for the region as well as the issues and challenges that the region is currently facing. So just a short background uh, about Muslim Mindanao. So this is the map of the Philippines and uh, the region has been, if you will see it, it's in the southern part of the Philippines close to Brunei in Indonesia. And the region has been the traditional homeland of Muslim Filipinos since the 15th century, even before the arrival of the Spanish uh, people. Uh, majority of Mindanao was home to indigenous peoples who were neither Christians nor Muslims. So there were there are a lot of indigenous peoples in this region of the country. In 1380, Muslim missionaries arrived in Tawi-Tawi, which is the southernmost part province of the Philippines. And they started the, the colonization of the area and conversion of the people to Islam. It was followed by the establishment of the Sultanate of Sulu, which is the second most southern province in the country, followed by the establishment of Sultanates of Maguindanao and Buayan. The Sultanates regularly challenged the Spanish Spanish domination, and it has been over. It was over 400 years of Moro resistance against Spanish, American, and Japanese rule. So the term Moro is derived from the term Moor, which, uh, which uh, classified to the people who subscribe to the religion Islam. So we use the term Moro to describe the people in Southern Philippines as those who have the religion of Islam. In 1903, there was a U.S. homestead program, and this facilitated the influx of migrants from the Luzon and Visayas groups of islands into the provinces of Lanao and Cotabato. This led to tensions about land ownership and the disenfranchisement of indigenous peoples or the Lumags and the Muslims. Uh, during this time, the native peoples of Mindanao didn't have land titling system in place. And it has been one. It was one of the root causes of the Moro conflict with the with the colonizers and the Philippine government later on. So this is a map of the Mindanao regions. You will see here different regions like Northern Mindanao, where Cagayan de Oro is, Zamboanga Peninsula, uh, where Zamboanga City is, is Bar Barm Gov. The Barm is composed of two types of provinces, the mainland, which is Maguindanao, and this is Maguindanao. And here surrounding the lake is Lanao del Sur. The island provinces of the Bangsamoro here is Basilan, Sulu, and Tawi-Tawi. This uh, little island here that you can see to the left part of your screen is Mapun Island, which falls under the territory of Tawi-Tawi. And this island is closer to Brunei and Indonesia than to mainland Mindanao. So during the presidencies of Quezon, Magsaysay, and Marcos, there was a continued promotion of migration in the, in the uh, Mindanao group of islands. 
And the best lands in Mindanao were given to settlers and owners of corporate ag agriculture. Most development investments and government services were offered to the Christian population. And during these presidencies, they obtained lands from native Muslims through harassment and violent means, which ultimately drove out Muslims out of their own lands. The Philippine government during this time did not immediately recognize Islamic laws and the system of education and socioeconomic development were unfair to the Muslims. During the Marcos administration, a very unfortunate incident happened called Jabida Massacre, which uh, gathered and trained a group of Taosug recruits. Uh, Taosug uh, are the, uh, is the name of the peoples living in Sulu which is the island province of Bangsamoro, one of the three island provinces of the Bangsamoro. So Javida massacre uh, was uh, happened because the Marcos administration gathered and trained a group of Taustug recruits from Sulu. They trained them in Corregidor Island to form a secret command unit to destabilize and take over Saba. This led to calls to impeach uh, former President Marcos and the establishment of the Bangsamoro Liberation Organization which later on joined forces with the Moro National Liberation Front or MNLF. This also led to the creation of the Muslim Independence Movement or MIM, which sought to secede this part of the country from, uh, to, for this part of the country to secede from the Philippine government or Philippine territory and to become a Muslim state. The Moro National Liberation Front was established a month after the declaration of the martial law. So this is an interesting map. Uh, I found this uh, shared in one of the talks that uh, I have attended before. This is the literal translation of Philippine provincial names in the island in the island group of Mindanao. So you will see here in Maguindanao, uh, the flooded plains. It meant, Maguindanao means the flooded plains because there is the Rio Grande de Mindanao uh, right in the middle of it. And then Lano del Sur means land surrounding the lake. Um, Basilan Pro Island Province means island of iron magnets. Sulu means island of ocean currents and Tawi-Tawi is island far, far away. I also would be uh, happy to share these slides with you so, so that you will have a copy of it later on. So in 1976, a tri Tripoli agreement uh, took place between the government of the Philippines, or GPH, and the Moro National Liberation Front, or MNLF, which sought to establish an autonomous region in Muslim Mindanao. During Marcos' uh, administration, there was a push to create two regional autonomous governments, namely Regions 9 and 12, but this led... Uh, uh, but these but this establishment of the regions sought to cover only 10 provinces instead of 13, as what uh, the MNLF wanted in the first place. This led to the collapse of the peace pact or the peace negotiations and the resumption of hostilities between MNLF and the government of the Philippines. In 1976 as well, in the signing of the Tripoli Agreement in 1976, Ms. Uh, Nur Miswari, the head of MNLF or the Moro National Liberation Front, he didn't consult the MNLF's key commanders, including Salamat Hashim, which then led to the breakaway group and the establishment of the current leaders in the Bangsamoro region, which is the Moro Islamic Liberation Front or MILF. So right now, the MILF is the one leading the government, is the one who led the negoti peace negotiations, uh, which started in the presidency of uh, Benigno Aquino III, the late Benigno Aquino III. And right now, the MILF is the one who is in, in majority in the parliament, in the Bangsamoro parliament, which we will talk about later. In 1989, there was a plebiscite or a referendum wherein four provinces voted to be part of the autonomous region in Muslim Mindanao. These provinces are Lanao del Sur, Maguindanao, both of which are from the, back, from the mainland provinces, and then the island provinces of Sulu and Tawi-Tawi. So during this time, Basilan was not yet part of the ARMM. 
1996, a final peace deal was signed between the government of the Philippines and MNLF, and also the peace talks between MILF and the government of the Philippines. This led to a ceasefire agreement between the government of the Philippines and MILF in 1997. However, the MILF or the More Islamic Liberation Front rejected the final peace ag agreement as inadequate, reiterating a demand for Bangsamoro Islamic State and not just political autonomy but through the establishment of an autonomous region. In 2000, in the year 2000, President Est former President Estrada declared an all-out war against the MILF, which led to displacement of thousands of people in mainland provinces of Lano, del Sur, and Maguindano. And in 2001, there was another referendum or a plebiscite which sought to expand the territory of ARMM to include Marawi City, which is in Lano, del Sur, and Basilan Province, which is the nearest island province to mainland Mindanao. So by, by the way, this photo is what uh, the former building of the ARMM government looked like from the outside. Now we go to the Memorandum of Agreement on Ancestral Domain, which started in 2008. It was the first peace deal, peace deal that was achieved between MILF and the government of the Philippines. However, the Supreme Court in 2008 issued a temporary restraining or order which prevented the signing of the MOA AD and ultimately the Supreme Court ruled that it was unconstitutional. So the MOA AD sought to establish the Bangsamoro juridical entity as a proposed subdivision under the Philippine government and it sought to expand the territory of ARMM to include six Lanao del Norte municipalities. Lano del Norte is not part of the Bangsamoro during this time. And also it sought to expand hun to hundreds of villages in Sultan Kudarat province, Lano del Norte, and North Cotabato provinces, and even some parts of Palawan. So in 2008, the Supreme Court said the MOA AD that was signed by the government, uh, that was, uh, that was the existing peace deal between MILF and the Philippine government, the Supreme Court said it is unconstitutional and it therefore led to, to more hostilities between the MILF and the government of the Philippines. It was during the presidency of uh, the late Benigno Aquino III that the peace talks between the Philippine government and the MILF resumed. And in 2012, they agreed to have the framework agreement on the Bangsamoro, which is like the backbone of the current organic law for the region that's, that established the Bangsamoro Autonomous Region. And in 2014, they agreed for the comprehensive agreement on the Bangsamoro, which fleshed out how the autonomous region would operate under a presidential form of government at the national level. Congress voted, uh, later on in 2018 for the passage of the Bangsamoro Basic Law, but it was stalled due to the, mass, to the clash in 2015 between the breakaway group of Bangsamoro Islamic Freedom Fighters. The, the BIFF or the Bangsamoro Islamic Freedom Fighter is a breakaway group of the MILF. BIFF rejected the peace deal that was, being, that was signed between the government of the Philippines and the MILF during the presidency of Aquino. And in 2017, there was a five-month war between the government of the Philippines and ISIS-inspired groups in Marawi City, which is, the uh, uh, you may have heard about the Marawi siege, a war that lasted five months in the city of Marawi. During the presidency of Duterte, the Bangsamoro Basic Law was signed by Congress in 2018 into becoming the Bangsamoro Organic Law, which which gives the autonomous region uh, the ability to become its own uh, region for that afforded the right to self-determination and genuine autonomy. And the passage of the Bangsamoro Organic Law, or BOL, it was uh, supported by a successful plebiscite in 2019, wherein the plebiscite was conducted in the areas of the former autonomous region in Muslim Mindanao, or ARMM. And the addition 
of Cotabato City and 63 villages in North Cotabato. So the ARMM was composed of five provinces, Maguindanao, Lanao del Sur, Basilan, Sulu, and Tawit-Tawi, including Marawi City in Lanao del Sur and Lamitan City, which was in Basilan, Basi, which is in Basilan. In the 2019 plebiscite, other areas surrounding the Bangsamoro region voted to be part of the region, namely the city of Cotabato, where the seat of government is currently, and the and 63 villages or barangays from North Cotabato, they also uh, agreed to join the Bangsamoro region. So from ARMM, the territories that consisted the ARMM expanded in, to include Cotabato City and 63 villages in North Cotabato. So right now we are in a political transition and it the Bangsamoro, Bangsamoro means nation of Moros because Bangsa in Tagalog means nation or Bansa and Moro is the term for, uh, that people, Muslim Filipinos ascribe to as their identity. So the Bangsamoro region was formed with the ratification of its basic law called the Bangsamoro Organic Law in 2018 which was supported by a referendum or plebiscite in 2019. Its establishment was brought by several years of peace talks between the Philippine government and the Moro Islamic Liberation Front. The Bangsamoro is a parliamentary system within a country that has a presidential system of government, and it is a Muslim majority autonomous region, which is in a political transition until, until the year 2025. So this cartoon here is a, um, this is what the build, outside building looks like right now. Uh, we just made it into a cartoon at our NGO um, to, to use in our social media presentations or um, promotions about the region. So right now, there are 5 million inhabitants in the region, which comprises 4.4% of the national population of the Philippines. There are 2.2 million registered voters. And in the region, we have 179 ethnic groups. Five provinces comprise the Bangsamoro. The mainland ones are Maguindanao and Lanao del Sur, and the islands, island provinces of Basilan, Sulu, and Tawi-Tawi. The current labor force is currently employed at 70%. The current context. So the region is in a political transition for another three years. What do we mean when we say a political transition? So a political transition is when you change your form and system of government from one to another. It also means that political institutions such as ministries, the parliament offices, intergovernmental bodies, commissions are being set up and reorganized. So what happened during the ARMM is that the government officials during the ARMM, they all resigned from their office because the ARMM was abolished with the passage of the Bangsamoro Organic Law and the result of the 2019 referendum. The region is also go, uh, going through a period of normalization, which means the disarmament of former combatants and the decommissioning of MILF and transforming the the camps of MILF into um, communities instead of armed communities. Also, right now, the region is um, going through uh, preparations for regular elections, which is scheduled to take place, so what, which was supposedly uh, in 2022, but the, par the interim parliament or the transitional government appealed to President Duterte former President Duterte to give them extension of three more years because of COVID. They were not able to submit all of the laws that they have to write. And so the region doesn't have enough laws for it to function as an autonomous government. Also, the rehabilitation of Marawi is ongoing. This is the core territories of uh, let me just erase. I don't know why there is a green there. 
but um, the, the, this is the core territory of the former ARMM. And in my next slide, you will see the difference between this core territory and the core territory of the Bangsamoro. Oops. So this is the current uh, territory of the Bangsamoro Autonomous Region. You will see that uh, this is Lano del Sur, this is the Lano Lake, Mariawi City where the siege happened in 2017. And Cotabato City is smack in the middle of Maguindanao, which is in blue here. And this is North Cotabato. These parts that are highlighted in yellow are the towns, villages, and or as we call it in Tagalog, barangays that voted to join the Bangsamoro. This is Basilan in lighter blue. Uh, Lamitan City is here. This gray part did not vote to be part of the Bangsamoro and this city is called Isabella City. So there is a part of Basilan that is not part of the Bangsamoro. This is Sulu and then this is Tawi-Tawi. This is the same island that I mentioned earlier, which is called Mapun. Still part of Tawi-Tawi, but very far from mainland Mindanao. So this is just a simple comparison of what the government or the political structure looks like under ARMM and BARM. So for the relevant law, it was the Armed Organic Act, which was uh, signed during the presidency of Cory Aquino. Uh, or Republic Act 9054. And in 2018, Congress passed the Bangsamoro Organic Law or RA, Republic Act 11054. Who is the head of region under the ARMM, which was the which is the previous political structure? It is it was the regional governor, and the regional governor was also the head of government. However, in the Bangsamoro, the Wali, later on I will discuss what the Wali is is he is the head of the he or he is the head of the region and the head of government is the chief minister or in other contexts the prime minister of the parliament like in germany the executive same as the national so they have like departments but in the bangsamoro they have cabinet uh it's called the bangsamoro cabinet and instead of departments they are called ministries the legislative branch is the Regional Le Legislative Assembly, which uh, the Regional Legislative Assembly was comprised of 24 people. Uh, and the, this, the division of the representatives for the Regional Legislative Assembly, hold on, it was uh, six from Lano del Sur and Marawi, six from Maguindanao, six from Sulu, three representatives from Basilan and three representatives from Tawi-Tawi. So three members for every congressional district. However, in the current context, the, the political institutions that are being set up is a parliament. And right now, the membership of the parliament depended on the, depended on the appointment of uh, current president uh, Marcos. So Marcos appointed 80 members to sit in the Bangsamoro Parliament to head the transition of the region. So this is what it looked like during the ARMM. So you see here the Office of the Regional Governor. Under the Office of the Regional Governor are the departments, different departments that uh, provided uh, the delivery of social services. Here you will see the legislative branch as spearheaded by the Regional Assembly, which has 24 members and 29 committees. And the judiciary is uh, the Regional Trial Court and the Sharia Law. It is very different from the political structure of the Bangsamoro. This is now what the government looks like in, in the region. So you will see that the parliament is made up of different colors. So here you will see a legend. So ideally, the parliament should be 
uh, comprised of 50% coming from political parties, 40% from the district districts of the Bangsamoro, and 10% or eight seats from the sectoral and reserved seats. And the sectoral and reserved seats will cater to the indigenous peoples, Christians, women, youth, traditional leaders, and the ulama. Also, a while ago, I talked about the wali. So the wali has the power to dissolve the parliament upon two thirds vote of no confidence by the parliament to the government. The legislative is the Bangsamoro parliament in charge of the laws and the executive is headed by the chief minister. He is supported by a cabinet of two deputy chief ministers and the heads of the ministries right here. We can go back to this later on if you have some clarifications or questions, I would be happy to take them. So this is what makes it controversial because the ARMM did only receives funding through general appropriations from the national government. So as you can see here, during 2010 until 2018, the budget for the region was less than 60, or it was less than 60 billion annually. But with the establishment of the BARM, the Urbang Samoro Organic Law provides automatic appropriation to the region of 5% of the total net collection of the BIR and the Bureau of Customs from the third fiscal year immediately preceding the current fiscal year. So in 2019, when the region started to transition into an autonomous region, it got a block grant of 75 billion from the national government. In COVID, it was 65 billion. In 2021, it received 75 billion. Last year, it received 79 billion. In 2021, 75 billion. In 2022, last year, 79 billion. And this year, it will get 85 billion pesos. So it, me it now means that since the region is an autonomous government, they get an automatic share from whatever taxes or custom duties collected at the national level. And it is pegged at, at 5% of what the national government collects every year. So going to this, to this slide uh, about the ongoing political transition, why is it important? Uh, the ongoing political transition in, the, in Southern Philippines marks the end of 22 years of peace negotiations between the MILF and the government of the Philippines. The establishment of the autonomous region also seeks to redress historical injustices against the Moros or the Muslim Filipinos. And the Moro Islamic Liberation Front has the opportunity to transform from being a rebel movement into a political party and government. The ongoing political transition also seeks to build a parliamentary regional government and a bureaucracy capable of administering and delivering social services. So during ARMM, which was the former political structure, the region was one of the poorest, if not the poorest regions in the country. And with the influx of investments and funding from the national government, hopefully the Bangsamoro region would be able to, to provide better social services to its people and uplift the lives of many Muslim Filipinos residing in the region. Also, the ongoing political transition, the MILF needs to deal with different constituencies and actors in the region, not only Muslim Filipinos because there are different peoples living within the region, like indigenous peoples, Christians, local politicians, and clan leaders. So another, another slide that describes the ongoing political transition. Right now, all of the government officials in the region are appointed, but these are some of their priorities. Within the next three years until 2025, they are expected to build and strengthen public institutions. So they have to hire people, they have to write codes or draft the laws or passage of regional laws. They also have to help 30,000 MILF fighters to return to civilian life, to uh, disarm them and make them give up their weapons voluntarily. 
also they need to redo the current regional government needs to redouble efforts to deliver social services such as education, health, and infrastructure. It also needs to prioritize the rehabilitation of Marawi and countering uh, extremism in the region or the vulnerab vulnerability of youth to join ISIS-linked groups. Also to improve its spending capacity on development programs and projects because the region receives a lot of money now there is very poor absorptive capacity for regional for the political institutions because the political institutions are still being strengthened and they need all the help they can get in terms of proposing and consulting the communities as to what kind of services these communities will need in the future so i think i am going towards the end of my presentation and i would be happy to have a conversation if there are some clarifications that you would like to raise but for the opportunities and prospects for the region the additional funding from the national government and the automatic appropriation from national resources is an opportunity uh, why because it will lead to more investments in the region Public roads are expected to be improved. The quality of education would be would improve, assuming that they use the money in, in the correct way. Also, another opportunity is that they are there are Mindanao champions in Congress, and in Senate, namely the House of Representatives and the Senate. There are people, there are politicians there that come from the region. So lobbying for national policy would be easier for Mindanao at the moment. Also, Mindanao is the hub for international aid and support uh, in the country. Uh, I saw someone raise their hand. Paul and Virgie Carlson. I was going to just wait till you were done. Okay, now why don't we just finish her presentation then we could ask questions. Okay, okay, sounds good. Um, there is a lot of international aid and support being poured into the region. So as an NGO worker from the region, I have worked with different funders like the European Union, USAID, Australian AID, Canadian um, AID. Even the Swiss are in the region helping the Bangsamoro parliament improve its political structure and laws with and, uh, the passage of relevant laws. So there is a lot of international support that is being poured into Mindanao right now, not to mention the 75 billion average fund that they get from the national government. And other opportunities or prospects for the region, boost investment and socioeconomic development from within. Since the region is currently drafting the relevant laws, they now can call the shots as to how these investments can take place. Also, there is genuine local autonomy and right to self-determination because they are they have their own form of government, which is a parliamentary form of government, and they can enact any laws that they want as long as it will not conflict with the laws at the national level. Also, this is one important opportunity, uh, the strong civil society presence and interconnectedness within the region and neighboring areas is very apparent. So there is a lot of nation building within the region and see uh, civil society is very strong and aggressive in terms of what they want the regional government to accomplish. Some issues and challenges remain still, even if the region is transitioning from, from the ARMM to, the, to a new autonomous region. The continu continued presence of private armed groups, clan conflict, or as we call it in the Philippines, Rido, and splinter groups or breakaway groups from the previous rebel movements. So every day there is at least one killing that takes place in the region. And two days ago, the, la the governor of Lanao del Sur was, was ambushed. Um, the people behind the ambush have yet to be identified, but uh, that ambush led to the death of some of his staff while they were uh, inside the car going from one municipality to another. That was just two days ago. So the governor of Lano del Sur, Governor Al uh, Alonto, he was ambushed. 
And also some of the issues and challenges is the weak spending of the region because everything is in flux right now. Everything is still being set up. Um, the political institutions like the ministries, the commissions, the parliament offices, they, 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 need, they are understaffed and the, the rules for budget, it's not yet clear at the moment. So they have a very weak spending capacity, even if their money is much bigger than compared to when it was the ARMM. Also, there is unclear intergovernmental relationship between the national level, the regional level, and the local levels of government. So the intergovernmental bodies have yet to be established. Also, there is a growing frustration within MILF. So we are expecting a, another breakaway group from MILF if this frustration continues. So there is increased factionalism as to how the MILF would govern the region. There are different sentiments. Also, some youth groups in different parts of the region are prone to recruitment by Islamist militants or uh, splinter groups. So that's, what, that's one issue that they are uh, conf being confronted with right now. Also, even with, with the additional budget from the national government, there is still a lack of infrastructure projects in the region, con especially connecting the... Let me go back to that slide. So right now, the island provinces are disconnected from the mainland provinces, and there is clamor to build bridges or establish airports so that um, more, uh, so that people from the island provinces can access uh, offices because majority of the offices of the region are in Cotabato City, which is in the mainland, and. The people from the island provinces can't help but feel excluded in the governance process because they cannot go to the office to simply ask questions uh, or to require some information about a certain project or activity. Also, uh, there are lap overlapping interventions between international donors. Sometimes there is uh, duplicates a duplication of efforts and this leads to waste in resources sometimes the efforts are also dictated by the international donors and this is one issue that the government the regional government is facing i think that's it pretty much for my presentation maraming salamat thank you and the shukran which is arabic uh, for it, thank you. I look forward to, to the conversation and to the questions, and I would be happy to give you more information about the work that we do in the region. Maraming salamat po. Thank you very much, Aubrey. Very nice. Okay, questions. Um, I there's something on the chat I saw, and it said. Uh, I heard that the national president, Marcos II, appoints members of the, the Bansangmoro, uh, the BARM. Uh, do the local residents have any say? There's an election, right? There is supposed to be an election in 2022, but the former parliament that ruled from 2019 to 2022, they... I would say begged pres former President Duterte for an extension of three more years. And the absence of an electoral code or a regional counterpart of the omnibus election code at the national level prevented an election to happen. So right now, Tita Elsa, you are right that um, Marcos Jr. appointed the members of the Bangsamoro Transition Authority. The local residents don't have a say at all as to who gets. Mm -hmm. Can I have a follow-up question to that? Does it mean then that the locals will have two? They have to select the local members of the uh, elect uh, the Bangsamoro, and then are they also allowed to vote for the national elections? Yes, that's correct. So they get to choose three sets of government leaders. One is at the local level: their governors, their mayors, their vice mayors. They also get to choose their government leaders at the regional level. So who gets to be member of parliament? 
and uh, third level at the topmost level is they get to choose who will be the president, the vice president, the senators, and the district representatives that make up the House of Representatives. So the the uh, the, uh, the provincial government they don't have a provincial government anymore. They do still. They do. Um, so what? The type of elections that took place in 2022 is the local election, which allowed them to vote for gov uh, for political leaders from the province down to the villages. The provinces uh, report then through through BARM eventually. I'm sorry, come again, Paul. Well, well, will the will the provinces then be reporting through BARM? rather than to the national election, the national government, rather than to Manila? Supposedly, they should report to the region, but th this is what makes it funny. The political clans that are being elected into the provincial, into the provincial uh, levels of government, they are not in good terms with the Moro Islamic Liberation Front. And um, this needs to be resolved before the 2025 elections because MILF fielded candidates uh, that ran against the political clans. That's why um, the provincial, the political clans that rule the municipalities, the provinces, the villages, they are frustrated with the MILF because the MILF did not consult the local leaders. Uh, Paul Carlson had a question, I believe. Paul, you still you still want to answer? I want to ask. Where, where did he go? Yeah, yes. Um, hang on. I have both a comment and and a question. First of all, Aubrey, I think you did a great job on giving background and information on Mindanao to those Thanks. of us. Uh, I have just one clarification on that: that prior to 1903, there are already many. Christian settlers in Mindanao. Uh, so for the people who don't know Mindanao history, I just wanted to clarify that because you said there was an influx starting in 1903. So in Verdi's province, for example, Ozama City, there's an old Spanish fort called the Cota facing Lanao. And mm -hmm. there were like Spanish friars and churches already built in, for example, Misamis Occidental. And we all know that Jose Rizal was actually in exile in the Piton, which is in the Polo del Norte. So I just wanted to clarify that, that it wasn't like that Christians all, all of a sudden settlers started arriving after 1903. They were already in parts of Mindanao prior to that. The yeah. second thing I wanted to question is, or my question was, you said there was 70% unemployment, um, which is very high, or 70% employment, which means 30% unemployment which is very high. I don't know how that compares with the rest of Mindanao. I guess my question is twofold. Um, is anything being done to kind of address that issue? Because I assume a lot of the unemployed are the youth and the men who would be tempted to join ISIS or different groups. And related to that is as you integrate or as MNLF fighters are integrated into the society, are they going to be increasing the unemployment level? Thank you for your questions, Paul. Um, it was even before 1903, there was a large influx of um, migrants from Luzon and Visayas group of islands that came to Mindanao. It was not solely because of the U.S. homestead program that a lot of migrants went to, the, to, went to Mindanao. Um, the Spanish, the Spanish uh, colonizers, they promoted uh, the movement of peoples from Luzon and Visayas to Mindanao uh, because they want these people to be assisting the displacement of the Muslim Filipinos that resided and the native peoples that resided in Mindanao. And as to the second question about the 30% unemployment rate. I think 7% of the 30% is underemployment and the 23% would be unemployment, which is still a huge number. I, uh, right now, they are trying to improve the, uh, the education system in the region. But like, uh, like I mentioned before, the region is being confronted uh, of the fact that they are understaffed. 
so they need they need they need to attract more workers for the for the ministry of education and teachers as well to provide schools with better with better um quality of education and also part of the unemployed groups include the former combatants or people who formerly fought in wars and right now there is an effort to normalize or to decommission or to disarm them uh, because uh, and through the provision of soci socioeconomic benefits or packages like um, a business or a plow to farm or uh, in some cases they build um, co cooperatives for former combatants to uh, to be part of so that they will give up their arms and return to civilian life peacefully so those are some of the efforts right now but uh, right now, it's not perfect yet, and a lot of, um, I would say, this is just an inside gossip that I heard, and please don't quote me on this. I know that this uh, webinar is being recorded, but right now they are saying that it is not impossible for another Marawi siege to happen, especially that fighters on the ground are are frustrated with how the MILF is handling the government or running the region at the moment. Uh, one question on the chat here and related to the youth. Uh, it said, uh, uh, this is from Isabella Alisna, where it um, so thank you, Ati Aubrey, for the presentation. I was wondering what are the factors that led youth to be vulnerable to being recruited by external groups? So our NGO conducted a study. I would be happy to provide a copy of the report of, as to what explains vul, uh, the vulnerability of youth. But one of the key findings was that they feel excluded in the governance process. And this has a lot to do with access to education, access to a a decent living or access to opportunities to earn a living wage and also it doesn't help that there is still islamophobia in the within the country so they feel like they are unaccepted or that they are always branded as terrorists and especially and in my experience before coming to mindanao i was totally unaware of what the region looks like or how the people in the region live so that part about uh imperial manila being or people from imperial manila being unaware of how the rest of the country lives so that's also one of the reasons why uh youth is um the target for recruitment uh, by the isis link groups okay here's one more question from this is from digna uh would you say that overall would you say that autonomous government in mindanao works better than being part of the national government thank you for the question um the region is still part of the national government uh it's just that now they have a total say on how they can run the government if i were to be asked like ideally the current setup is more preferable because they get a lot more funding from the national government and they are able to pass their own laws they have the right to self-determination they can address their problems by themselves by promoting good governance at the regional level but this is all in principle and if the transition is not done right if the right policies or relevant laws are not enacted in time and that political institutions remain weak in terms of spending and the and uh, delivering social services i don't think that it, the current region would be better off compared to the armm so this political transition is very important right now to uh, for all the right things to be done for the all the right institutions to be established all the community all the relevant laws to be in consultation with communities it's very important I have a question, yeah. Joffrey. Uh, with this uh, transitioning from arm to barm, what holds promise from the perspective of, you said there are 176 indigenous people in the region that are covered. And from the perspective of the indigenous groups, 
and from the NGOs within the region, um, not necessarily uh, Muslims, like the Nonviolence Peace Force and other social justice organizations that are working in the region but are not Muslim oriented. What mm -hmm. holds promise for them with this change? Thank you for the question. Uh, one of my key programs in the Philippines is the inclusion of indigenous peoples in the governance process. In the parliament, there are 80 elected uh, members of the parliament, two of which should come. It is stated in the law that two uh, of the 80 members of parliament should come from indigenous peoples. They also uh, they also established an office called the Ministry on Indigenous Peoples Affairs. But also um, these offices would be, it's not enough to establish, to establish these offices. It's important that these offices are actually being led by indigenous peoples and not by those that are close or in good relations with the uh, Moro Islamic Liberation Front. Because one, one problem that we have right now is that the MILF camps or the command centers are all in ancestral domain lands of the indigenous peoples. Mm -hmm. and if, the, if the violence within those ancestral domain lands are not addressed or not brought to justice, then there would be a friction between the, Moro, the Moros and the indigenous peoples if they are not, if the relationship between them will not be improved. How about the Christian groups within the region? They are also represented in the parliament. And um, right now, there is a good relationship between the Moro Islamic Liberation Front and the Christian settlers. Uh, but that remains volatile at the moment. That can change anytime. So it's very important that um, the camps, the camps where the armed groups are, would, be, will, uh, would give up their weapons voluntarily so that if conflict arises, they will not resort to armed conflict or to armed interference with each other. Yeah. Well, thank, I, you. I, thank you. Thank you. Okay, here's a question. I have, I have a follow up to that one because uh, uh, there is, you, you showed in the organizational chart, uh, there is a uh, ministry of Sharia law. How does Sharia law apply and who does it apply to and you know um i i know of someone already that's used this sharia law kind of uh in the, on the national level if you want to get a divorce just become a muslim and you can get a divorce already nationally but how does sharia law uh, apply uh in uh in the arm in the barn so right now uh, they still do what, uh, how it was done during the ARMM. So the Sharia courts are separate because right now, even with the transition, they have not fleshed out uh, the interrelationship, the intergovernmental relationship between the, the regional trial court and the Sharia courts. So that is something that they have to flesh out after tw uh, before 2025 ends because then the transition period would be over and if that intergovernmental relationship between the regional trial court and the sharia courts under the supreme court are not uh, agreed upon or there is no existing law that would explain the relationship it would be a disaster in my opinion so the re regional parliament is currently working on that Okay, could I have, there's a question in the chat and it's mm -hmm. uh, coming from Raul. Just your personal impression, how willing do you think is the MILF to share power that the non-MILF power centers or plants? Is this, is this a major obstacle to long-term peace and development in the region? Personally, um, I would I would share this, but it's based on my experience as an NGO worker. Um, I would say in my experience, the MILF welcomes the participation of other non MILF like the MNLF that I saw on the news a few months ago that uh, Murad Ibrahim, the leader of the MILF was shaking the hand of Nurmiswari from MNLF. 
but in my experience um interacting with MILF they are a little bit exclusionary uh how so uh so one of the programs that I handle in the Philippines is the establishment of political parties in the region so that by 2025 people who come from the communities can actually run in the regional parliament and when we invite the MILF to participate in our activities they always say no mm. and maybe they are busy with the work that they are doing uh, because it's really difficult to run a regional parliament or a regional government and at the same time, say yes to invitations from NGOs. So that's one thing that I understand. But um, in my experience, they have not said yes. So maybe they are just busy or they have other priorities. But based on the news, they welcome the participation of other non-MILF. And if they are, and to me, uh, to answer this question, if you are the holder of the power, the, the human tendency is to grab onto it mm -hmm. um, and i am not sure if that's what milf's real intentions are especially if there is already an existing factionalism within milf uh that's one thing that i can i can share okay um well i have some one more this is coming from jolie and She's asking, would you tell us a little about your uh, affiliation with the uh, professional affiliation with the Nonviolent Peace Force? Has it been a good experience for you? Yeah, Julie was the one who connected me with Nonviolent Peace Force. So thank you so much, Julie, for making that connection between me and Anna. I'm enjoying my time with Nonviolent Peace Force. I have been involved in many of their uh, programs in the United States, and I have also been in communication with their Philippine program team. I am learning a lot about peace infrastructures around the world in conflict areas like in Sudan, Myanmar, Ira Iraq, South Sudan, and um, I have a lot of inspiration to bring back with me when I go back to the Philippines, like community-led initiatives that I can probably propose to my NGO. So I'm really learning a lot from my time in Nonviolent Peace Force. That's great, Aubrey. I'm so glad. Yeah, thanks. Thank yeah. Thank you, Julie. Yeah, I, I, uh, she's saying one time, Aubrey, that they're they're making her work. The <laughs> nonviolent peace force. <laughs> okay. Um. Uh. I think we could get one more question if there's one, and then I think we'll officially close the presentation. One. Here's one more. Uh. Um, oops, here's one. Okay. Um, here's one from Paul Carson. Yeah, this is one more question. You mentioned clan leaders, whoever they are, are they open to? Is this the same as Raul working with the MILF or BARM leaders? Is is confusing to me. The, the clan leaders are the political families in the region. So I can name them as the Mangudadatus, the Ampatuans, the Alonto Adyong, uh, the Semas. So they are the political pol politicians at the local government level. And they are open to working with the MILF. But uh, like, uh, like, men like I mentioned earlier, the MILF fielded candidates who ran against them. So right now, the relationship between the political leaders at the local government level and the MILF is very sour. And if that doesn't change, there is no collaboration that can happen during this transition. The MILF candidates, they did not win, but they, they only won in one city which is Cotabato City, but most of their fielded candidates, I was, I'm answering Tita Meg, the question of Raul. Yeah, of Raul. Yeah, I see that. He did not win. And the MILF said that we are just testing the waters if we can actually win an election in 2025. So that was their uh, answer. Okay. Uh, well, thank you very much, Aubrey. It was really good, very educational. 
And somebody mm -hmm. have said, said here, um, uh, thanks for the nice presentation. Aubrey is a very good speaker. Good coverage slides, very helpful. Thank you so much. So, um, so we officially close and we're gonna leave the Zoom for, we have a meeting after your presentation. So thank, thank you. Thank so you very much, much Aubrey, it's great. Thank, yeah, it's very good. Yeah, very nice, Aubrey. Hello. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Very informative. Have a good weekend. Bye-bye. So we'll have five minutes, guys. Break. Okay. Okay. Thanks.